This is a limited edition 35 Whalen rifle from a company called Griffin and Howe. It is not cheap. Take the Ruger American rifle, a very budget friendly option, which we all know. You could literally get about 40 of these for the price of one of these. So the question we're gonna answer today is, what goes into making a $50,000 rifle? Griffin and Howe is located at a country club for guns. So that rifle that we started building way back in 1934, Jeez. we still build that very same rifle today. The knife is made from 100 layers of Damascus to commemorate the 100 year anniversary. 275 hours go into a rifle like Ooh. this. Ooh, that felt good. Yeah, that felt good. One of the best quotes I've heard about stock making is, you cut out everything that isn't the gun stock. Yeah, you got him. Right on the shoulder. Get out of here, coyote. <laughs> we don't want you in New Jersey. It took me to some place of having a suit measured for you that's for your dimensions and your body type and everything. And for building custom guns, I guess, why not apply the same treatment to it? The world of luxury hunting rifles and shotguns is a totally different part of the industry than I typically play in. I often say that 2011s are the supercar of the gun world. Flashy good looks, performance, sexiness, you know, it's like they race, that, that's what they wanna do. You gotta think Ferrari, Lamborghini, McLaren. To keep it in car world, heritage, rifles and shotguns like we're going to look at today those are the most luxurious cruisers that are out there you got to think maybach and rolls royce and i don't know a lot about them to be honest with you and today we're going to change that as we figure out exactly what makes a fifty thousand dollar rifle okay so we're here with dan who is the shop foreman if i got that correct yes sir for griffin and Howell. So we're talking basically what makes a bespoke um, rifle. And I guess you guys work on shotguns also, to, to my understanding. Absolutely. Um, so why don't we go just kind of like 30,000 foot overview. Um, like I, I come from 1911 world where things can get kind of crazy. Sure. In prices, but like heritage hunting rifle shotguns, like totally different thing. So I can draw some correlations, but I'm kind of fascinated to see some of this because I'm like, okay, you know, how do, how do we get to some of these like bespoke sort of crazy things? Sure. I think there is some translatable, uh, translatable things between the 1911 world. Um, th the first thing you need is customizable options mm -hmm. and you need a patron, mm -hmm. right? You need a patron of the arts that's going to say, you know, I want this 1911. I want these particular grips on the thing that are handmade by whomever. Um, I want it engraved with this particular scene. Mm -hmm. um, and and we, we take that same basic concept and, and apply it to, uh, you know, fine bolt rifles uh, and single shot rifles as well. So what really makes for a bespoke firearm, first and foremost, is, a, is the client, is yep. the patron to, to want to pursue that. So, you know, we generally start the conversation with, what do you want to do? with the rifle. So it's all made to order, really, at Correct. the end of the day. Correct, yeah. 100%. Yeah. And it is, okay, gentleman's maybe going uh, on a, on his first buffalo hunt mm -hmm. and wants a real good show-off piece to, mm -hmm. uh, to take to Africa. So we know we're going to be building something on a big bore. We yep. select an action. We select a strong, <laughs> strong piece of wood that's also extremely beautiful. Um, that 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 client client's going to sit down and and pick from a selection that I really? kind of curate for him. So maybe there's maybe there's five blanks. I've selected these five blanks. They're strong. They're pretty. Now, do you like blonde, brunette, or redhead? Right? You pick your pick Not your poison. Right. No, no one likes redhead. Right. Right. No, no one likes redhead. <laughs> But so, that's a, the South Park thing, uh, ginger people have no souls. <laughs> Dan, you're, you're preaching the choir here. Our, our audience was just like, yes, Dan. Like, uh, I've been told many occasions I'm going to hell and I got a one-way ticket. So, right? um, you know, it is what it is at this point. Guys, here's the deal. I feel bad doing this in a classy place like this, but I'm going to show you my waistline. Okay. I meant Dutton Farm, so I can't go full sin, but you see it. I got a Segura belt on, right, at a very classy location. I'm going to do this back up. Right, then I get kicked out. But here's the deal. Segura sponsored the channel for a long time. They make the belts we wear. Um, this is the light inner Velcro belt, um, the emissary. Then the regular emissary, I use that more of a range belt, but they got battle wagons for those of you guys that are into doing battle or battle with cardboard, which is probably more likely. Um, bunch of cool stuff from mag carriers to um, 
vehicle for your truck, for you know tourniquets, essential gear, things like that that you want to have close by. So you should definitely check it out. The code is 1911 Syndicate. There's no spaces in that. Don't you dare put a space in there. That'll save you 10%. Check that out. Great gear. We've worn it all the time. And I kid you not, at Hudson Farm today, someone came up to me and they said, what belt you wear? They checked me. They checked me here today. And I said, you know what? And he just walked by. He checked me. And I said, I got a Segura belt. What? Yeah, I'm on camera. Yeah, yeah. Hillbilly, get out of here. Anyway, back to the video. <laughs> So would someone typically like, if they're gonna do you know, one of the higher end rifle builds, would they typically come here in person and go through some of that process? Or, or is it a lot, of, I guess a lot of it could be remote as well, I suppose. So we do business all over the country and I'm at Griffin and Howe as a company all over the world. Um, we can do it remotely, absolutely. That's mm -hmm. the lovely thing about modern day technology is I can walk somebody through this over FaceTime or you know WhatsApp, whatever. Yeah, yeah. At some point in the process, unless the guy is is built to you know fairly standard dimensions as a human, um, we do like to fit the stock as well. Getting the client in here to do that is um, is pretty important. Okay. Um, but that can be overcome from a distance if necessary as well. Okay. Uh, this is always the most, it's always the most enjoyable both for the client and the gun maker if we can get them on site. Sure. Having a beautiful facility like this helps to be able to have oh, those people come in, stay oh, the yeah. night, go through the process with us. Mm. Um, and it's fun, it's fun for the client and it's fun for us. I mean, we, this is what we do, this is what we love. Mm -hmm. um, so usually when you get together with a passionate client, his passion matches ours and the whole process is, is uh, it's very enjoyable. Oh no, I'm, I'm already into it. So, so like what's a couple, you know, references we've got here? So we built, um, we built nine 100 year anniversary rifles and this is what our company started doing um, way back in, uh, in the 1930s. So- Is this the 35 Whalen? Uh, or, or, or no? This is the 35 Whalen project. Okay. But this is a um, this is a Mauser based uh, custom rifle. Okay. And what Griffin and how what Griffin and how got their start with was taking military actions. At first, the uh, the 1903 Springfield. It was a really well made action, mm -hmm. but the military rifle wasn't appropriate for field use. It was large and unwieldy and a great combat weapon, but it's not what a gentleman hunter wanted. Sure. So they basically stripped everything away. They took the action, refined it, made it more aesthetically pleasing, put the top of the line barrel on the thing, and then hand stocked it. And they also came up with very early on a quick detachable sighting system, which mm -hmm. is the Griffin and Howe side mount, which is what you see on this rifle. So that rifle that we started building way back in 1934, Jeez. we still build that very same rifle today. Um, this was a military Mauser action. It's been completely reworked. Um, blueprinted, barreled, quarter rib, side mount, and a bespoke stock made um, to the client's dimensions. Okay. And from the piece of wood that he selected. Jeez. Okay, very cool. Uh, not unusual in a build like this, 250, 275 hours go into a rifle like Ooh. this. Um, these rifles alone have, I think they averaged 125 hours of just engraving. Wow, holy cow. So, and so like, what, what would those typically go for? These ones, we, we, I believe we sold these 100 year rifles at right around the 40 to $48,000 mark. Okay. And that depended on what options those rifles had. Because sure. we yeah, built yeah. them with, some were built with top mounts, some were built with side mounts, some were quarter ribs, um, some had peep sights as backup sights. There's a, it's one of the complicated things about these is there's a million ways to configure a a bespoke rifle, right, right. and you have to, uh, you and the client have to climb inside each other's brains and try to sure. figure out how we're gonna build this thing. Sure, well, which is probably a good segue. So what we'll do, we'll head over to the range, we'll um, plink around with some of these bad boys, and then we'll come back to the shop and kind of explore some of the, the, the weeds and the nitty gritty of what goes into this stuff. Sounds good. Okay, so we're here with Brett from Griffin & Hell. Welcome. Awesome. Big show, are you nervous? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, <laughs> I'm kidding. You shouldn't be nervous. Um, so, what do we got? What's the first thing we're going to shoot? So we have a we have a Griffin and Al Highlander rifle here. This is our pretty much our go to hunting rifle here. Okay. Um, six five Creedmoor Defiance uh, Rebel Action. Um, we have a Hoodoo break made by Southern Precision. Okay. And um, yep, yeah, this is our pretty much our go to lightweight rifle. 
We normally have Swarovski optics on it. This one's currently got a uh, X5i on it. Okay. Um, but cool. So this is kind of a uh, Griffin and Rifle, or sorry, Griffin and Hell. Could we call it a starting place? Could we? Could we say this is you know m more of like Griffin and Hell? You know, this is a good place to begin your journey if you're yes. getting going. Yes, I would say so because. Um, if you're out west, it's a good it's a good rifle for if you're in Wyoming and that, and you got to go up altitude. And down. Yeah, yep, yep. you got to go high, you got to go low. It's a nice lightweight rifle um, for its for its design. It's you know you can shoot it really accurately off the bench. You can it's basically your dual. Okay. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, let's see if I can hit anything with it. Sure. I don't shoot uh, long range very much, so you just tell me anything dumb that I'm doing. Okay, it won't hurt my feelings. So we'll go on. Uh, we'll go on the hundred yard targets over there. All those paper targets out there are pretty clean. So I'm gonna go uh, far right top target. Perfect. How light is this trigger, just so I know what I'm walking into? Uh, two and a half pounds. Okay. That's pretty much our standard for the Highlander rifle. Got it. Inch left, half an inch low. Can you send one more for me, and then we'll make an adjustment. No. Nah. I mean, truthfully, first one's probably, hey, new gun, haven't oh shot it, you're working out the kinks. Yep. Um, second one, I was a lot more in control of what I was doing. So. Perfect. Yeah. Start shooting some steel. Sure. Um, we can go to the 200 yard target. So if you look, there's a black wall straight to your right. Yep. If you look to the left, there's kind of a plate rack. Good hit. If you would like to, then we will move out to probably three. 300 yards, there will be a plate rack. There's a square and a couple circles. Yes, sir. There it is. I got him. Good center hit. All right. You want to put one more? Oh, you got that. <laughs> Good hit. Center hit. About there where you're aiming right now. Yep, got him. So that's about 470. Kind of a hunting scenario. Is it really? Yes. Wow. I not have thought that was 470. Good hit. Good hit. Good hit. All right. If you go, if you pan right from that target that you were just shooting at, pan right, you'll see a white rack with white targets on it. That's 700 yards. Yep, got it. You said that's seven? 700 yards. Good hit. Good hit. Look center. Yeah. Perfect center dot right there. It's almost like you guys have done this before. <laughs> it's almost like you know where that brass is gonna land. This is a controlled round fed rifle. Okay. Uh, three position safety. So best thing to do is when you go up to load in, put one in, push it down so that it's seated in the mag and then feed it in from there. Oh, okay. Um, just to save you the trouble, obviously. Because the last one you shot was a push feed yeah. action. Okay. So it's just, you know, you can single feed those, but it's just easier to clip it into the mag, let it feed up into the, into the claw. And then when you close the bolt and you want to get set up, just pull this all the way back. That'll lock the bolt and make it safe. Push it all the way forward and you'll be good. All right. Whew, that felt good. Yeah. That felt good. Uh, so I'm going to stay right side, uh, but the bottom tart. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Would you like to send one more before we make an adjustment? Yeah, I can't see where that is. Uh, you are... You are center, but you are two inches low. All right. I see that yep. off to the left a little bit. Yep, right. one inch left, one inch low. That second shot felt good with you? Second one felt pretty clean to me. Okay, perfect. So yeah. we'll, we'll make a quick adjustment on this. Nice things with these optics is a lot of hunters set up the BT tyrant like this, mm -hmm. so you can preset your yard. Good center hit. Uh, the 300 yard plate with the cross on it, white cross. Good center hit. It's all that paper trail. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. can't miss that, that one. big bullet going down there. Honestly. It's a nice push on that rifle, right? Oh Should yeah, she, she's got some, yeah, she likes to get, she likes it's to get it, But you. it's more of a push. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a different response yeah. than that, than that uh, Highlander for sure. If you look to the left of that target you just hit, there'll be a blue ram kind of on the, the tree line there. What's that at? That's 350. Okay. Go. Good hit. Wind pushed you a little right, but that was like right in the chest area. Nice. That's a dead ram. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Dinner. Right through the top of the lungs. 
you pan right from the target you just shot, you'll see. Sort of right to that original wolf. Yep. Yes. Yep. That will be our 500 yard again. I'm just going to adjust you real quick. So 500, we're, we're about at, generally speaking, max distance that you're probably taking ethical shots on this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That feel about right? Absolutely. Starting to get a lot of drop on that bullet. Got it. Good hit. Yes, sir. Just a, just behind that's a yellow coyote. Have him poke at that. Okay. Let yellow me... target or yellow coyote? Yellow coyote. Oh, yeah, I got him. Yeah, there he is. There is a little bit of a yard change on that. Give me one second. Just under his armpit. Yep. So if you want to just hold, you were holding probably center, right? Yeah. Yeah. You want to hold maybe just top of his back. That'll sneak right into that shoulder. Because, yeah, you're literally, that's literally a coyote sized target. There you got him. Right on the shoulder. Get out of here, coyote. <laughs> we don't want you in New Jersey. Oh, perfect. Sweet. Um, this is fun. Yeah. Making noise and breaking shit. It's the ultimate man stuff. Yeah, no, it is. <laughs> I would say it's like golf for men. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, this is, you could, you could do tennis or, you know, do cool shit. <laughs> Guys, do you like gear? The simple question, do you like gear though? Because I can only assume the answer is yes, which means I have good news for you. We have a sponsor, their name is Big Tech's Ordnance, and they got gear for you. They got lights, how do I know? I just got some, X300s. They got acros, how do I know? Just got some, right? For some new 2011s, should be coming up here soon. Anyway, the code, a uh, little suspect, 1911 SYN, spelled S-Y-N. I'm not sure if there's a message there they're trying to give me, like I'm some sort of Utah sinner or something, but 1911 SYN, S-Y-N, that'll get you guys 10% off the store. A couple things to know, comes with a constitution and candy, and that's A-OK -okay in my book. Um, if it shows in stock, it is in stock, and if you place the order before 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, that's Texas time, um, they're gonna ship that damn thing out the same day. So check it out, great dudes over there. Final thing, 1911 Syndicate, if you guys need any real estate help, let us know. Um, I work in the Salt Lake City market, but we got agents in Vegas and Dallas, Colorado Springs, handful of other cities. Let us know if you need help with that. That is truthfully the main thing that keeps the lights on around here so that we can bring you free content. And uh, Patreon is another great way you guys can support for behind the scenes, um, sneak peeks at things, Q and A's. We've got some special merch, Zippos, things like that that we give out. So check that out. Sorry for the long plug here. Back on with the show. So Griffin and Hal's located at Hudson Farm. We covered a little bit about this amazing showroom here in the Hudson Farm video, but I figured I'd show you guys around a little bit because obviously you see um, the gunsmithing area where they you know, build the Griffin and Hal rifles, um, but this kind of puts in perspective what's happening at the facility because essentially Griffin and Hal is located at a country club for guns. That's kind of the best way to look at it. Um, so they do everything from um, you know, apparel. I'm picking up one of these bad boys. My mind is made up. I'm picking up one of these bad boys. Sitka uh, apparel that's branded with the, the, you know, the embossed logo and everything. I'm like, I'm, I'm just about it and I need that. Um, but I mean, at its core, this is a pro shop. This is, a, you know, this is a gun shop. So um, it's not just Griffin and Hal things. So um, you guys are gonna annihilate me in the comments. That's fine, but like Fabri, like I'm not, I'm not a shotgun hunting rifle guy, right? But I'm gonna assume these are very, very nice, okay? Because they are into the six figures up there, fellas. Um, we've got a bunch of purdies. Um, I believe we talked about with Dan earlier, but you know, they'll, they'll work on the purdies and um, blousers and, and things like that. They've got some of the Griffin and Hal stuff over here. So over here, they'll have, um, you know, some of their different options. Th these are mostly more of their higher end things. Um, Griffin Hal Mauser, you know, again, I don't know all their different models and everything. Um, this has been on display for us today to uh, look and play with. Basically this is a hundred year anniversary rifle because Griffin Hal's now been around for over a hundred years. So, you know, we've talked about how the stocks are made, the engravings are done, all of that. They take the leftover wood from the stock and use that to make the handle and the knife. 
The knife is made from 100 layers of Damascus to commemorate the 100 year anniversary. Obviously all the leather's done um, incredibly well. The case is, I mean, you know, come on, like do, do I need to really tell you that this case is pretty spectacular? It's just like, I want to live in there. Um, there's our rifle that we've been featuring today. But I mean, you guys get a sense of it. It's, yes, you can build a gun, uh, yes, they can work on your guns, all that kind of stuff, but like, this is a true lifestyle experience here. But with that said, we will get back to talking about what makes a $50,000 rifle. Okay, we're back in the shop with Dan. So you mentioned earlier doing a stock fitting. Yeah. And that sounded really cool to me because it, it took me to some place of having a suit measured for you that's for your dimensions and your body type and everything. and for building custom guns, I guess, why not apply the same treatment to it? Sure. Um, and yeah, that's that's a, a really important part of the process. So we're gonna fake our way through this today a little bit, but um, typically how we would do this is we would have a, a pattern stock made up for the, the client. Um, and through the use of Bondo and bending, we would um, we'd fit that pattern stock to the client with the barreled action in to the point where He's happy, we're happy, everything looks like it's going to um, it's gonna point naturally. The the big thing on this is anybody can get behind a rifle that that doesn't fit in the prone position and get lined up with the scope and take a good shot. Yeah. We want our rifles to point like shotguns quick. If okay. somebody has to take a snapshot at a buffalo or, or whatever the case may be, the rifle needs to handle instinctually as well as it does from a fixed position with mm -hmm. plenty of time. So how we would do this is we'd start with literally a pattern like this. Um, I would have the barreled action in, the sights on the rifle, primarily with just the open sights, mm -hmm. uh, if it has express sights or, or whatever the case may be. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the client to, to mount the stock in the natural position and have alignment with those sights without having to get into the stock, move his head, try to try yeah. to have to wrap himself around the uh mm -hmm. the stock itself okay right we want that thing to come up just like a shotgun boom i have sight alignment and now that buffalo that's trying to kill me is dead it's one of the big evaluating things is length of pull so that's the distance from right. the trigger to the back of the butt stock right 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 um and in this rifle if i can just have you put that up to your shoulder sure. i'm a lefty so ah. everything is kind of backwards here so everything's backwards right yep. and the length of pull is far too long you can see how your your face is off the cheek piece if you want to come around okay. and, and get a shot of that which is funny because this feels fine to me right <laughs> because i don't this is a different thing than i than i do you know it's a different style of gun for me so i'm like i don't know Feels pretty good, Dan. Yeah. Like, you, you know. <laughs> well, that's a that's a good start since it's uh, since it's wrong-handed and, yeah. and too long. Sure. Um, but that's that's kind of the foundational piece. Is we would know for you, and if this was a left-handed rifle, the first thing we have to do is start taking off some length. So instead of your face sitting back here in the cheek piece, we're more you know close to the optic. Okay. We've got full contact with the comb. Okay. And then the next thing we would evaluate is the the height of the comb itself. And we would build that up or take that away until your eye came in alignment with the sighting system. Yeah, I mean, different people got, you know, some people got fatter cheeks than others and, you know. That's right. Out of the skinny face, doesn't have as much padding, to, I guess. Yeah. Yep, we're all built differently. Yeah. And for people with large faces, they need more cast off. And we we sure. take we take the stock and actually bend it in one direction or the other. Yeah. Based on, you know, the gentleman's hand, how high his cheekbones are, the width of his face. We do the same thing in the shotgun world. Mm -hmm. There's a little more forgiving in the rifle world than the shotgun world, but still very important. Yeah, and so this is basically our starting point. Like this is, this is how we begin. Correct. So once we get the uh, once we get the pattern worked out, we're going to have a dimensional template to work off of. So this is going to get set off to the side, and we'll take all our dimensional references from the pattern, and then we'll actually start creating that out of this blank of wood. Mm -hmm. So through the use of uh, various machine tools, and then a whole bunch of hand inletting. All of this metal work, this stock you see here, this that stock comes out of, of that piece of wood. So all of the metal work gets inlet or let in mm -hmm. to the blank. Um, and once that's, once that's done, all of this wood has to go away. Um, one of the best quotes I've heard about stock making is, you cut out everything that isn't the gun stock. 
Hmm. Like you're done removing wood when you have nothing but gun stock left. Yeah. Um, and I can show you an example um, of what happens when you don't cut out enough wood to sure. get to a gun stock. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so give us an example of what we're looking at here. Okay, so as I was saying, one of the things you have to do as a stock maker is cut out everything from the blank that isn't a gun stock. Um, I picked this rifle to highlight uh, the differences in kind of taking the stock making to its its full conclusion. Um, if you if you notice the size of the forearm on this very nice rifle, it was built by a, a very good company. Um, it is left extremely heavy here. Uh, it does not taper with the barrel. It's very, very blocky, very large forearm. And this is for a 300 Winchester Magnum. This is typically not a cartridge you would, would build such a heavy, large forearm for. What we try to do, and again, within what the client's trying to accomplish, very similar cartridge here recoil-wise, this is a, uh, a 35 Whalen for comparison, is this forearm tapers very, very nicely and it matches the taper of the forearm. It's much narrower, has a much more lively feel on the hands. It will point much more naturally because of the way this is shaped. When I was asking, it, you know, 35, uh, not being uh, really from this side of the firearms world, are these of similar calibers or are they totally different where you go, well, yeah, it makes sense because it's a massively, you know, bigger round. But I mean, we're saying these are pretty effectively similar rounds too. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the 300 Winchester Magnum is gonna be higher velocity, uh, longer range cartridge. The 35 Whalen's more of a, a medium bore intermediate cartridge. But as far as the actual use of the thing and how we would make a gun stock for that class of cartridges, it would be, they'd be very comparable. Pretty similar, yeah. Because recoil is gonna be very similar. Mm -hmm. um, Let me ask you this. So w when it comes to the wood itself, like, I'm going to assume there's not just one wood that is used, that there's probably some degree of options and, and even within those options, that is part of what dictates how crazy are we, we getting here? Sure. Um, well, we can have that discussion quickly. Uh, God created one particular great piece of wood for rifle stocks and okay. shotgun stocks too, and that's English walnut. So that's uh, Circassian would be the name of the species. Okay. Um, Circassian walnut is the finest. The pores are small, so it finishes very nice. It has elasticity, so it doesn't like to crack and fracture. Uh, it takes checkering very nice as well. The inletting can be made very, very clean. If I were to pull this barrel to action out, you would see that the the inside is as beautiful as the outside of the stock mm. um and actually we might have one we could we could take a look at before the end here yeah next down the list is going to be um american black walnut okay so that's it's a little more difficult to work with it tends to be a little harder um a l fractures a little more easily not necessarily under recoil fractures when you put tool pressure against it okay um and then from there there's claro walnut which is n native to uh, the Pacific Northwest. Um, and Claro has all of the problems that black walnut has, only worse. And then on and on it goes down the list, like the, the uh, so maple's it's, been used. It's, okay, I was gonna say it's largely walnut though. It is, walnut's absolutely, the, the, the various species of walnut is, is absolutely the, the most appropriate gun stock wood. Okay. Um, back in the, back in the uh, Pennsylvania long rifle days, the wood of choice was, um, black cherry, okay. uh, which is native to this region, um, and uh, maple as well. So used a lot of curly maple okay. for- uh, Curly for the, maple. Yeah. yeah. And that's just the figure, it yeah, it's, it's cool. I just like it, you know, it's just cool. Is there one that like someone's working on? We can see some of the hand finishing and stuff? Oh yeah, I believe so. Okay, all right, let's check that out. So I think part of, I did a company like Griffin and Howe, part of what you're paying for is the the access to people that are true craftsmen at their work. So Fabrice, you're from France. Yes. Yes, right. Exactly. We have the Olympics coming up. Yeah. Well, hopefully yeah. it goes well for France. Um, so wh what do you, what is this? Uh, it's like that. This is my, uh, in reality, this is my business card. It's for presentation. I'm making the, the totality uh, case, pistol uh -huh. and tools. So you make, so you made all of this? Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. I mean, the tools. You made the tools. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, just for, is this your personal yes. gun? Yeah. This is just personal. for you. 
No, it's not just for me. I mean, for, so it's just for our presentation for the because uh, this pistol it represented the different uh, work. Mm -hmm. the, uh, example, uh, I'm making the barrel. Uh, you have a blowing. This is very specific. After uh, I'm making the, the uh, I'm presenting my job for the uh, the wood, mm -hmm. the, the checkering. You have a different work for yeah. uh, this project. I, I, I mean, I mean, this is incredible. I mean, this is really so. How many hours do you think um, to make all of this? Uh, Eighty, uh, eight uh, hundred hour. Eighty. Eight hundred. Eight hundred. Yes, eight hundred. Eight hundred hours. <laughs> oh my god, that is insane. Oh my God, that is incredible. So anyway, guys, I mean, I mean, the video is about rifles, but I, we could not show you this because again, this is the kind of like skilled old world craftsmanship that you're getting here. Really cool. Thank you. Thank you for showing us that. Okay, so let's keep digging in. So, I mean, something you just even highlighted to me is average build time on one of these rifles is, is what? 250 hours. 250 hours. Something like that. And just the sort of decision-making process with the client is several hours. Yeah, uh, that, that conversation can go on for two, three hours. I've had clients spend a half a day here just getting the details down on paper as far as what right. we're gonna do. So this is crash course, everyone. Let's keep this, keep this in mind. So we, I mean, I mean, so we've talked about wood. So what, what else is there, or stock, you know, what, what's kind of the, the other big things? So, the, the big thing, first and foremost, is decide if, for the client to communicate what he wants the rifle for. Right. Um, and let's base this discussion around a, a 375. The guy's going to Africa, he wants to shoot a buffalo, he wants to shoot some planes game, and he wants one rifle that's going to be versatile enough to do both. So the first thing we, we would determine in a discussion like that is, well, first and foremost, that's a long cartridge. 375 Holland and Holland is, is big. We need a Magnum Mauser action if we're going to house that. Or... Um, another Magnum uh, length uh, action. So immediately we know that whittles down our action choices. Okay. Um, and then the gentleman's already told me, hey, I'm gonna be hunting dangerous game with this thing, so I'm gonna you know, all but demand that he go with a control round feed action so that he has control of that cartridge from the time it leaves the box magazine until the time it ejects from the rifle. And is it a push feed action that's flopping around, uh, flopping the cartridge into the chamber? That's very important because in the heat of the moment, mistakes can happen and we want control over that cartridge. And that's important for our client safety. Jeez. So, so we're uh, making, yeah. Okay. yeah, we're making decisions based on, you know, function and safety and all of that. Um, once we get the action uh, chosen, then we're going to talk about what barrel the client wants, how heavy he wants the rifle, which is going to determine how um, how uh, big a barrel profile we mm -hmm. uh, we run on the thing. Um, we use some of the finest barrels in the industry: uh, Krieger, um, Packnor. We use Douglas as well. Uh, just depends on. The client schedule, their schedule, and whenever possible, I, I like to use a, a, the best cut rifle barrel, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we use a lot of Krieger in those particular cases. So. Sure. Yeah, I'm nodding because again, I'm like, I'm gonna take your word for it. That's an amazing barrel. Like yeah, it's, it's it's in a wheelhouse that uh, is outside of my my purview. Um, okay, so we've got barrel, we've we've got action. Um, I mean, it seems like engraving has to come into the. Oh, it, into the picture here. It does. Like the, I guess the next step is is sights. Okay. Um, and again, for our, our scenario here of building a dangerous game rifle that he can also use on planes game, I'm going to want the gentleman to have express sights, um, usually on a quarter rib like you see on this particular rifle, which is another piece of steel we add to the barrel, both for aesthetic purposes, but also to give a place to... to um, mount your express sights that's going to align very nicely with the eye and with the banded ramp front sight. And this is what we're calling express sights. Correct. Okay. So this is a three leaf sight. So we've got this regulated in this particular rifle, one, two, and 300 yards. Okay. So you flip the leaves up for your various distances. That one obviously hasn't been flipped in a minute. So yep, those flip up. Got it. Flip down. And then since he's also going to be using this rifle for planes game, we're going to set up a scope and it's going to be on a quick detach system. Okay. Um, the reason for that is falls down in the middle of his safari, breaks his scope, mm -hmm. scope comes off, he has his irons, it's not going to ruin his hunt. 
Um, or he gets into really thick, nasty stuff and decides the scope's actually going to be an impediment. Mm -hmm. Scope can come off, go in the pack, and he's rolling with his express sights. It, it, and scope coming on and off will still maintain zero and... Oh, 100%. Yeah, we're good on zero, though. Absolutely. Yep. When we have two different systems to do this, the side mount and then the Griffin and How top mount, which is on these two rifles here. But yes, it's the throw of two levers, slides off the dovetails, mm -hmm. um, and it'll go right back to zero. These usually go back with at 100 yards. From, from the experimentation I've done, you're within a half quarter MOA of, of sight shift and okay. hell that can happen during the day just based on heat i was just so, saying temperature altitude i mean you know there's all kinds of things that can come into play there um so yeah once we get that all that discussion worked out with the client and next we're typically on to well do you want to invest in engraving yeah and if so that's a that's a massive conversation again you can spend i'm going to talk to the client for three hours about the rifle build mm -hmm. if he really wants to nerd out and then he's gonna spend an additional three hours with uh, our engraver, Chris Ross, who is actually my brother, um, about how he wants to make that rifle his own, sure. right? And that's a lot of the personality of these bespoke weapons is how do you want to apply the art? Um, so, yeah, I, I was gonna say like, so what, you know, what, you know, what's an example? We, we, Cause this is pretty heavily engraved. Yeah. So this gentleman wanted to use this rifle for large Western game. This is a 35 Whalen, um, throws a big heavy bullet, and it's a great elk cartridge. So typically what they'll do is if they do get a game scene, which this has, they are going to select a game scene appropriate to the cartridge. So if a gentleman's building a hmm. 375 or a 404 Jeffrey, they're probably going to have Afri large African game on there, right? Okay. Elephant, buffalo, that kind of thing. Um, beyond that, then you get down to scroll work. Yeah. And all of, this, all of this work you see on the rifle here is all scroll work. I mean, it's just wild. And I mean, so, so how much time do you think goes into the engraving on a gun like that? This... Um, there's 200 hours in this rifle. Holy cow. Yep, 200 hours of engraving in this rifle. And there's a whole bunch of different kinds of scroll work as well. Wow. There's English rose and scroll, there's German scroll, um, there's large Foley American scroll, and on and on it goes. And every engraver has you know, different styles they, they like to work within. So, um, and a good engraver can do them all, personalize all of them, uh, and every single one of these patterns is unique. So what our engraver typically does is he will draw all this out for the client ahead of time. Mm. Maybe not with all the very, very fine shading detail, yeah. but the client will have a very, very good understanding of what he's getting on the final product. And then he'll actually sign off on the design. Right. So it is created. There is no, there's no standard here. Yeah, there's yeah. no, we engrave our rifles yeah, this one art. way. Yeah. It's true art. It's one of one. Wow. Um, and so... I, I, I think it, in some ways is the easiest way to put in perspective how, because because this is, you know, ballpark 50 grand? Uh, correct. Yeah. So if we're saying there's 200 hours in the engraving and, and then the additional time on the rifle itself, which is we're ballparking at what? 200, 200 plus hours. So, depending. I mean, we're saying there's roughly 400 hours that have gone into this. Does it really seem that outrageous? Because I think, you know, a guy who, uh, you know, buys a Glock 19. I've got a Glock 19, right? But it's like, you go, okay, this is a perfectly functional thing. It was 500 bucks. You go, 50,000. You know, what, what, what is that? Five, uh, 100 Glocks? I could get 100 Glocks or, or this one rifle. That's right. You, you go, okay, 400 hours went into making this thing. I, I, I mean, these are legacy pieces. You they know are. I mean? Th these are pieces that are, are in wills and, you, you know, I mean, there's they're significance to them. These are all heirloom. These are all heirloom creations. Yeah. And if you think about it, <clears throat> this has been going on for as long as there's been weapons. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the uh, ancient Saxon kings used to have their, their, their swords made out of made out of laminated steel, right? They were Damascus swords. Not mm -hmm. everybody had those. Mm -hmm. They were made because they were highly functional and highly beautiful. The hilts were adorned with gold, right? They were engraved. They were wrapped in the finest, the finest leather that they could mm -hmm. find for the, both the scabbard and the handle. Yeah. It's, 
craftsmen have been applying art to weapons for as long as weapons have been in existence. Yeah. And all we're doing is carrying on a tradition that's thousands of years old. Yeah. Um, and it's just the canvas is, is more modern, right? But yeah. it's the same thing. It's taking that, this is hard to put into words, right? But it's taking that, that fulfilling, that soul fulfilling thing that's the hunt, right? A mm -hmm. hunt's a sacred thing mm -hmm. if you're doing it correctly. And having the art applied to the weapon for whatever reason mm -hmm. makes us humans very, very happy. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and yeah. It, it, it lines those two things up as much care as I put into training for the hunt, for booking the hunt, for getting myself prepared, both mentally, mm -hmm. whatever, having a, having a beautiful weapon to go and it's do that with. It's part of the whole thing. And I don't know the psychology that ties the whole thing together, but I know that it's as old as human beings. I get it, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, to me, to, to me, it just makes sense. I, I think there's people that appreciate um, genuine craftsmanship and a... Um, I, I work with a bladesmith and, and he basically said, uh, I'm butchering the, the exact line, but something to the effect of, hey, once something leaves, having a practical need, it sort of shifts over to like an artistic need. AKA, if we, if we go, could you go get a 300 Win Mag modern whiz bang rifle for significantly less? Sure, of, of course you could, you know, but it's like, this is now, hey, we've left the, you need this. And this is now trending towards like, there's history, there's art, there's significance to it. It's like, it's, it's beyond the practicality. Like this, this is there's no longer a practicality thing in my mind. It's like a, I appreciate fine things and the heritage behind it. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And it's the same thing we see in fine automobiles, right? Yeah. It's your, your uh, Honda Civic will get you there, but the Bugatti is going to get you there a whole lot more stylishly. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it fills the same, it fills the same need. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. Well, I appreciate you showing us this. Um, we'll probably cut over some final thoughts, but I mean, this is really, really cool, man. So, Excellent. Yeah, awesome. Dude, really appreciate it. This is so that, much fun. That go okay? <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, guys, so final thoughts. What makes a $50,000 rifle? To be perfectly honest with you, intellectually, I kind of understood it coming into, the, into today because I just know that so much is in the man hours that goes into making a gun like that. You know, we talked about it with Dan. 400 hours in some of those guns that we're looking at. Like that is insane. So it's like when you really break it out, I don't know, someone in the comments can do that math. You go, is it that crazy to think that some of these guns can be worth that much? I don't really think it is. When you come here and you see it in person, I know a lot of people won't have that experience. I don't know, if you come here and you see it in person, you'll be like, well, yeah, that makes sense. This is a lifestyle, like this is pure class. I mean, I can't overemphasize it, guys. This is pure class. Look around. Look around, guys. This is like a spectacular thing that we've gotten to see today. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. With that said, we'll see you guys next week.